Welcome to Dispatches from the Front as we rejoin David Scott in his extraordinary interview with Brian and Janice Doherty, the couple who lost their children, stolen by social services, stolen by the state as a result of reporting the actions of a paedophile. David Scott uh, from Northern Exposure. Uh, I'm here uh, on the 4th of June and uh, we're continuing our discussions with Janice and Brian Doherty about their experiences with Police Scotland, uh, with with uh, the the uh, social services and, and other government agencies within Scotland and with the threat posed by uh, paedophiles to uh, innocent families who just happen to be in the wrong place at the wrong time. We uh, left the story with... Uh, a paedophile having approached a family and offering £25,000 for access to their son, Sebastian, who is uh, autistic. And uh, after, after removing, uh, the, 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 or forcing the paedophile to leave the property, um, the family then had to decide what to do with this uh, extreme and, and bizarre situation. Um, so, if um, if I could uh, ask you then, what what was the first thing you did with this information to uh, to start to get uh, uh, official involvement and uh, protection? Um, we uh, we contact we, we talked about what we were going to do. And the first people we thought we'd contact is the experts who are supposed to be the experts, the National Crime Agency, who I emailed on the fourth of August. And alerted them to this neighbour's proposition and the danger which was being placed against my family. And uh, so that was that was August the fourth. So what what sort of response did you get from the National Crime Agency? Well, there was a it was a it was a brush off really. Um, where on their website they say that their involvement is to monitor and help with um, detecting paedophilia, but um, really they brushed us back to the local. Officers, and then I you know, emailed them back to say, "No, this is what your website says." But they were not really interested in taking it further. They wanted my address and my phone number, but that was it. And they suggested I contacted the local police in Police Scotland. Okay, so you were put put forward to the local the local office of Police Scotland. So which office, which branch was that? Well, we lived um, between Fraserburgh and Peterhead at the time uh, on this Viscount's estate. It was slightly closer, I'd say, to Fraserburgh. So the local I called this hotline 101 or you know the standard line and they put me in touch with a local officer called Sergeant Sam Buchan. Okay, and did, uh, so that that would be on the 8th? That was, the f- that was on the, the 8th, that's right, Friday. Friday the 8th, yeah. right, okay. Um, and um, so did what did Sergeant Buchan do? Well, when he took my call, he was aware of who I was. Um, I'd already spoke to a woman in a call centre and she recommended this man. Rather peculiarly, he asked me about my children, first of all. Um, when I mentioned what this was about, he was very calm. He said he'd just the officers for the job, and he told me to attend Peterhead Police Station, which was further away from where we were based, um, that night at 7 o'clock, which I duly did, so I left at 7. Um, my wife, who was home at this time with her children, well, you could say something about that. Um, was visited by the Viscountess, came marching around the house. I didn't answer the door. She came down to the house shortly after you'd left, shortly after seven, and um, she was shouting through the letterbox. She walked around the house a good few times, thumping on the windows, um, you know, thumping on the door. And I just thought, well, no good can come of this, so I'm not going to answer. I don't, I don't think this is a, a wise move. So I didn't answer the door. Um... And then also that night there was a, a large flurry of cars up to the Viscount's estate. Now, where we lived, the road was absolutely dead. It was barely three cars a day, and that was just you know people who lived further down the road. So suddenly, on this Friday night, um, about an hour after my husband had phoned the police, there was a, a just the car started to just pour down the street. A constant flow of traffic. Just before I left, there was a lot of cars coming. Now, this was a a small, very, very... You couldn't find this place without knowing that it existed. You would only get one car, maybe two cars a day. It was a single lane of traffic, a single lane road. 
and it was it was impossible to find. I mean, I coming back from work would get lost trying to find it. It was that kind of place. Um, it was only ten minutes, fifteen minutes from Fraserburgh. Uh, the same from Peterhead, slightly longer from Peterhead, but you would it was so uh, remote. Re- remote um, and suddenly there was all these cars summoned for an emergency meeting at the Viscount's house. Um, the I first went, person up there at six o'clock was Alan Lowe, who Alan came Lowe. shooting past at tremendous speed and, and drove straight van. up to So, it. so the paedophile who approached you uh-huh. is, has gone to the Viscount's house, yes. and then a whole stream of other traffic. Yes, generally fancy cars. Generally quite impressive cars. Right. And high, so high value cars, um, which is completely abnormal. Oh yes. Speed uh-huh. along the lane. Mm-hmm. And this is all happening whilst you are in Peterhead. It started, it started before, just you, before, before you left, yeah. but it continued after you'd gone. And this was a road which you would not drive fast on because it was a single lane and it was very, very windy. Very windy but, you know? Yeah, very dangerous. So I went to Peterhead at 7 o'clock and I met with two officers. And contrary to what Sergeant Buchan had said, these two officers were extremely new probationers or maybe a year more than that, but no more than that. Um, in terms of experience, were very inexperienced, and they had very little. They could, as a teacher, for some years, you can tell when children understand what you're saying, or even as a lecturer, you can tell when older children, teenagers, understand, and you you modify your your lecturing or your teaching. With these officers, they were so inexperienced, they didn't get some serious, important points that that a layman would get with some experience with Peterville. Never mind a police officer. So Buckins commented, "These were just the officers for the job." Maybe um, as far was, as he was concerned, they were just the officers for the job. If the if the job was not for this to be investigated, they were perfect. But if the job was to do a thorough investigation, these officers were completely inappropriate and um, inexperienced. Okay, so you 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 sent to see these two, um, almost brand new officers, um, and uh, what's the next interaction then with Police Scotland after after that? Um, the next, I gave a statement to the officers, it lasted for about an hour and they didn't give him a statement to sign. One of the officers seemed to be acting, PC Catherine Lamont was acting as Sergeant Buckins right hand person there um, and I left and returned home. My wife was in something of a, a state I think it's fair to say because of the number of cars that were stopping outside the house or speedily driving down past her house without their car lights on and when I returned the gates were closed which they never were and I half expected someone to, to try and attack me because the gates were never closed. It was pitch black. We were in the middle of nowhere. And when I get in, Janice told me about the Viscountess marching around the house and all the flurry of traffic. The next day, Buckin, um, this was Saturday the 9th, came to our house. He refused to come in the house. He was attended with Catherine Lamont, who I'd seen previously with another PC. And he spent the best part of half an hour attempting to dissuade us over and over and over. So let me just follow the timeline here. So you report this to the local police. You'll report it to the National Crime Agency in the 4th. They direct you to the local police. You go to the local police on the 8th, and then one day later on the 9th, the sergeant in charge is at your door and he's trying to dissuade you from from taking the complaint forward. That's right. He he had made no investigation. Well, well cl- he, clearly he, not, because <laughs> there's been no time. <laughs> Apparently, all they'd done was ask Alan Lowe if he was a paedophile, and he'd said no, and uh, so, 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 so that was it. <laughs> case closed. He, he actually said to us that, he said, um, well, he's, we asked him, are you a paedophile? And he said no. So and there then, he was, and he just kept saying, how he, can I persuade you how, there's nothing here? How can, how can I, I convince you, you there's nothing here? How can I persuade you? What will it take for you to realise there is nothing here? What will it take for this to go away? It was phrases like that, which at the time we thought were very odd. And a bit like when we were dealing with the Viscount, we were there thinking that we were reporting a dangerous man. And when we were speaking to Sergeant Buckin, what we were getting was comments which were inc- quite incredible or ludicrous to the point where... <laughs> He would say things like, um, why would you think he was a paedophile? I'd say, well, he offered me 25 grand for my son. And he'd go, that doesn't make him a paedophile. And I've said, <laughs> and it's just, it was comments, and even more ridiculous than that, where I said to him, look, 
Well, the, the crazy thing is we didn't realise, in our stupidity and naivety, we didn't realise that he was trying to block it and trying to persuade us to drop this. We and just actually thought, trying to bribe us. Uh, yeah, we, we, the, we the missed comment. that completely. <laughs> the, how can I persuade you? We didn't pick up on We were trying to convince him more and more that there was clearly a problem while he was trying to it was, it was this, it was this to it, drop the whole thing. The only way I can describe how, how crazy this was was he said to me the previous day that I should go to the station because he, he didn't want to attract unnecessary attention to our house, so I should go to Peter Head. They wouldn't come out to see us on the Friday. And on the Saturday, he turned up and he wouldn't come inside the house. He stood outside in, con- in contradiction to what he'd said previously. And then it was the only similarity or the only parallel I could make to, make to show you how farcical this was. It was a bit like somebody saying, how do you know the guy standing with a jerry can full of petrol with a massive torch throwing petrol on your house, lighting your house afire, how do you know he was the arsonist? I say, well, I've got a video and I'm covered in smoke and the house is burnt down and I've got a video of it and the guy submitted that he set my house on fire. He offered, he, you know, and um, the sergeant just kept repeating over and over, how can I persuade you that there's nothing here? So we have, we have your first-hand witness testimony that you were approached by a paedophile and he made you an offer and the paedophile... Or, or the, the person who made the offer, I understand, didn't even deny that he made you the offer. You subsequently found Yeah, out. we discovered a few weeks later that he actually... Admitted it. Uh, yes, it, but he claimed that the money was a charitable donation for our son. <laughs> a charitable donation to, of £25,000. <laughs> of £25,000 from this stranger what, that we don't know. What think. makes this ludicrous <laughs> is this man was particularly tight. I mean, Aberdonians are known for being a bit tight with money, but this guy was the exception. I mean, exceptionally tight. And... Uh, at no point did we discuss charity in our conversation. My joke to the sergeant was, "What's this? The Jimmy Savile excuse, the charitable donation?" Because he was, he just at that point I didn't realise, and Janice was the same that he didn't, he wasn't there to investigate. He wasn't there to investigate. He wasn't there to do his job. No, he wouldn't look at the greenhouse which was booby trapped, which fell on her daughter and cut her hands, and that was just thirty yards away. And the other officer who was there, who I saw the previous evening stood with her head down and she wouldn't make eye contact. She just stood there shaking with her head down. She was absolutely, you could you could sense that. Well, I tried to speak to her a few times and she wouldn't respond. She would just stood there, head down and, and, and remain quiet. Um, until the, the end, I spoke to her briefly when she took some registration num- registration numbers from me that I'd, I'd written down the previous night um, from cars that had slowed down outside the house. Um, but apart from that, she she remained quiet the entire time. He he was acting like a sort of amateur solicitor for the Viscount and Alan Low. And he was also perfectly aware of of their. We said because actually we saw the Viscount test come down to Alan Low's house in her car. Um, she drove Alan Low down the, the on the Friday night round about midnight or just after midnight. Um, and but Buckingham told us that the Alan Low hadn't stayed in his own house last night. He'd stayed. I think it was up at the Viscounts. I can't. Call if he said specifically it was up at the Viscount, but he said he stayed elsewhere. Um, so, so Sergeant Buckingham was very aware of everything from their side of things, uh, all their stories, and uh, he was very aware of that. And um, he also, I think it's worth pointing out at this point to substantiate some of this, that some months later, after our children were taken in January and returned to us in February, in um, in May, when I received a cover up report by Professional Standards for Police Scotland. They actually named Viscount, Lo- Viscount Petersham as at the police station with Sergeant Buckin. So six months, seven months later, they stated in the report to me, they threw the Viscount to the wolves and they said that Sergeant Buckin, the man who I first contacted in Police Scotland, the man who said he just did the officers for the job, the man who came out the following day having made no investigation and tried to dis- dissuade us over and over, there was nothing there. In the very night when I was making my statement, to Police Scotland in Peterhead, he was in the Fraserburgh Police Station with Alan Lowe and Viscount Petersham at the very same time with those two men, which is the most surreal situation where before these two men had been accused, or rather, well, we, never we were accused. never accused Viscount Petersham, we didn't know of his involvement at all. It was his own actions and threats to us that gave that way. But um, before we'd accused Alan Lowe, there he was in a police station with a senior officer or a promoted officer who had told me he had just the officers for the job, who this following day was telling me there was nothing there, no investigation, nothing to see here. Okay. So in the in the week that followed um, the, this this interaction with um, Sergeant Buchan, 
um, you'd had a very surreal weekend. What 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 occurred during the following week? Was there any changes? Immediately, um, they hired a, a landlord, hired a wee digger, um, like a like a, a kind of earth digger, which you can hire from a, a place that you can put into a trailer. Yeah, well, mini digger. Mini, mini digger, digger, yeah. <laughs> and it was being used at night on the Viscount's estate. It was we pitch could... pitch black out, and it was um, it was um, y- you know it was uh, you could hear a pin drop because it was very very rural, very quiet. So our bedroom was overlooking the estate, and we could see the the, the, the lights the, on at night, the, the kind of um, fog lights, or what have you got the the headlights, uh, walking lights, walking yes. lights, yeah. and the digger working only at night. We could hear it, and we could see the lights. And then from Monday to Friday, non-stop, a uh, plumber's van, or a drainage van, went back and forth repeatedly. There was one thing we missed out, which is that um, my wife and I had alerted the police to, in their attempts to try and brush this away, we'd alerted the police, I, me on the Friday night in Peterhead, and Janice and I on the Saturday evening outside our house, that there were a number of things unusual about the house that we were renting on the estate, and the garden, the large garden estate, which suggested that children had been detained there. And the following week, there was a portable digger, a mini digger being hired and used only at night. And there was a large curtain cider van, a drainage van, shuttling to and from the estate at peculiar hours without its lights on. Right. Now, obviously, I'm, I, my professional life, I'm, a, I'm an engineer, I build buildings. Um, excavation at night is not something you would do because it's very much diff- more difficult to see what you're doing. Um, it would only be uh, large projects with very tight programs where you actually have to have 24 hour, work, 24 hour working uh, under lights uh, where that would happen. So it's a very unusual situation, certainly so any sort of minor work you wouldn't do that. The cover of darkness seems to be uh, inexplicable for any normal use of uh, excavation plant on an estate. It just wouldn't happen, um, and and you so as well as this this unusual excavation uh, activity in the week following your police report, um, your police report also mentioned physical physical concerns about the the layout of the estate. Um, uh, so um, there was also a continued campaign, which started after I told Alan to stay away from my children. There was a continued campaign of intimidation and vandalism against our property and loud noises at night and men. Our house was surrounded by stone chips, so we could hear men's footprints in the in the stones outside the house at night. We could hear um, we could hear banging noises. The cars were being targeted. There was dead animals placed outside the log cabin, which was in our garden or outside the house. Altogether, there was a number of things happening. And when we last spoke to the police, they said they would send patrol cars around to our house. We had very young children in the house, and we pointed out that the house was in a remote location, and they were easy pickings. Um, Someone had blocked up the chimney, and the windows didn't open. The windows were painted shut, and we pointed out that if somebody started a fire, it was extremely dangerous. Um, Altogether, the police said they would send patrols, but never did. They never investigated the booby-trapped a greenhouse which fell on our daughter and cut her hands, designed for our son because his toys were placed inside there um, and we were left well, to we just felt ourselves um, we're at, that we were in a great deal of risk really. in danger so, you, so, so you're, you're in this isolated rural location mm. and there is no help coming no help coming, no help coming. Um, so the, the further from that um so what's what's your what's the next state involvement uh, with your family after that? Well, um, Alan Lowe and the Viscount disappeared off the face of the earth. We we didn't see either of them. Normally, we'd never saw them together, um, but they they disappeared for the next sort of ten days. Approximately ten days to two weeks later, two social workers turned up at our door. Um, one social worker seemed quite clueless as to why she was there, but she was accompanying the the one who was leading the charge. And her opening gambit to me when I opened the door was, um, we know there's, we, we've been informed there's been a, a, an issue with children. And I said, no, there's, there's not been an issue with children. There's been a report to the police of a paedophile, someone who's tried to buy my son. And she kind of brushed this comment off. I said, no, there's been no issue with children. The issue is with her neighbour. So I, I, I stood speaking to her um, and tried to explain this. 
my family were heading out um, and we went out and did our shopping. When I came back, I contacted the manager of social services in Fraserburgh, a man called David O'Neill, the manager, the regional manager, he was called, or the area manager. And I asked why <coughs> he'd sent two social workers to our house, um, literally, you know, a matter of days, 10 days or so after I'd reported a pedophile, which had not been investigated. Um, I, I phoned his office a number of times and he wouldn't speak to me, so I emailed him and he emailed back to tell me that there had been a concern report, a report which I didn't even know what this meant. Um, a concern report was submitted by Police Scotland against our family. Oh, right. So the Police Scotland didn't investigate the paedophile, but they reported your family. So Police Scotland reported your family to social services. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, well... Um, it was the, the concern report was supposed to have been submitted by PC Catherine Lamont, um, who had gone off immediately on annual leave after um, we'd we'd uh, we'd spoken to her on the, the Saturday, um, and uh, she she had gone off on holiday and, and she um, we didn't we didn't speak to her. So this report was submitted. David and Neil. I asked him what this was about and he emailed me back and gave me the very, we've never received this report in two years, but he gave me the four key areas in which this report was submitted by Police Scotland. Right, so there's four, four, four areas of concern yeah. from Police Scotland. Okay. The first one was that we were, um, to twist our own words, to use them against us, that we were isolated. So we'd already said that we wanted... We were in we danger because we were isolated and, where we lived. And now this was used against us to, to suggest that. that we were isolated and our children were isolated as though we were isolating our children, where our children had very active social lives and, and so on and so forth. The second thing they said was that our children were not in education, um, which was a lie, and, demon and demonstrably so or demonstrably so. The third one was that um, we were obsessed. <laughs> obsessed with, <laughs> with pedophiles. pedophiles. So you wake up in the morning... <laughs> put your clothes on, you have your cornflakes, and you go, I know what I'm going to do today. I'm going to obsess further about paedophiles. I'm going to go and report the first person I meet and accuse him of being a paedophile. So, um, yeah, one report of a man who didn't deny offering us £25,000 for our, our son and apparently were obsessed with paedophiles. And the third, and the fourth one, um, the obsessed one was the beginning of the line which was that we were delusional. Uh, this was the beginning of a drum that we'd be beating over the next... It's still, it's still being yeah. beaten. That, that we are mentally imbalanced. So, but of, of these things, so they, they are, you're allegedly uh, crazy obsessed <laughs> um, and isolated. You live in rural Aberdeenshire in the middle of nowhere. That's that's evidence of isolation. So the only element of the, these these concerns that might be based in any sort of factual, measurable, testable thing. Mm. is that your children were not in education. Mm. Um, now, um, it, does that mean home education? Is that, is that, is, is that the provision that you had made? Yeah. Well, Ale well, Alexandra, our oldest, was home educated, which was actually her own request because we had had her in school yeah. and she had requested to be home taught. I mean, obviously she didn't know about... We didn't actually know Alex about, was, about home so, teaching Alex either, but she said quite to me... A, a tough time in school. She was being bullied when she was little and she said to me, could, you, can I, you know, could I not teach her? And I thought, well, gosh, yes, I probably can. So we looked into it, and well, we were very, we were very, um, you know, we met at teacher training college. We we're both tertiary educated. I was a teacher. The last people, I mean, I would lose my job if my children weren't in education. And apart from anything else, we are very much in favour of education for obvious reasons. So the notion that our children were not in education was just, apart from being slanderous, was an outright lie. Now, I understand the situation in Scotland legally is if if you don't. Um enrol your child in school, you can you can educate your child at home um, without any sort of state involvement or permission. But as as you had enrolled Alexandra in, in school, um, you do need a, a form of permission to to change that provision to, to home education. So we was that, that something you had in place? Yes, we had that. We'd got, we had that um, previously when we lived in Perth and we had when we moved up to Aberdeenshire, we arranged it with Aberdeenshire Council. So we had written permission um, from the Home Education Officer for, for Home Education. And with our son Sebastian, um, because he'd never been enrolled in school um, and the law obviously says that you don't need to, to apply for it if you haven't enrolled, it, enrolled your child. We didn't apply for it because it wasn't necessary. Uh, Seb 
couldn't cope with crowds. He couldn't cope. We had put him into nursery on a trial basis for, a, a, you know, like one day a week for a few weeks, and he hated it. He just couldn't cope with it. So he, because in fact, it's a noise in nursery. Yeah. It's a noise in the, in, in the nature of autism. They need to and actually, in what happened condition. with him was that every time I took him down, he would be moved into another room on his own, and they just put him in front of a DVD. So I thought, well, he hates it, and this is pointless. And Janice so, was doing such good work with him because. At the university, you did your MA in language and literature. Yes. So you were doing a lot of speech and language therapy. Um, we I were told they would never really speak, and he came on leaps and bounds, and Janice was doing so much with him. I think we should point out, um, there's something I, I forgot to mention, which is that when Sergeant Buchan could not persuade us, to use his words, that there was nothing there, because every time he said that, we'd come back with more. <laughs> very, <laughs> Tried very, to persuade him. <laughs> <laughs> um, for the past the last sort of five to ten minutes of his visit, his attention then focused on our children. So the day after I'd made my statement and he couldn't dissuade us, there was nothing there, he then focused his entire attention on my name, my date of birth, where I was born, our children's details, where I worked, what school I was in, etc, etc, etc. And it was as if there was been a, a plan of attack, which is what happened. Um, and the Viscount's threat of social services was coming to fruition. So... Y- you had this uh, allegation by social services. There are, there are four areas of concern. I can't the remember only, the fourth. It was something trivial. The well. fourth one was along the lines of we were kind of mental again. It was uh, something... Um, was it not along I can't the lines really of, can't um, It was something, again, unimportant. Something sort of... <laughs> It was, yeah, it was, it was something to the effect that we were unbalanced or, or fixated on paedophile rings or we, we obsessed know, or something. It, it was something... I can't uh, so, it was but the only one that's testable, <laughs> objectively, was the home education one, and that is, it, they were demonstrably in error in what they were saying. Yeah. Well, that's right. So we, we had... I mean, it wasn't easy so, for us to get... Um, because I remember it took... Um, but I sent the home education certificate to um, three people... I sent it to David O'Neill, who was the area manager for social work, Richie Johnson, who was the director of social work, and the children's reporter by recorded delivery, no less. I sent him proof that the local authority had given us permission to home educate our, our child, Alexandra. And, and did you get an acknowledgement from this correspondence? We, in, in fact, got none. And the, the, what, what happened what? was that the, it, the, there was clearly an agenda uh, we felt there was an agenda. We sent this by recorded delivery to prove that what was record was said by police Scotland was false, totally um, libelous, and we sent um, this by recorded delivery. Um, David O'Neill lied and said that he hadn't received it Which by e- by email. He had said that he hadn't received anything, and I checked online royalmail.com dot com, and it had been shown through recorded delivery that. A person in his office called Summers had actually re- not only received this, but signed for it as you do with something recorded. And so he had actually got this document and he had seen it. So there was a senior social work manager lying. He re- I remember, strangely, um, when I wrote my complaint, he received that at something like 10, 30 in the morning. And at three o'clock in the afternoon, he sent me an email saying that he didn't have that. It was the longest he'd taken to respond to any email and it was obviously that he couldn't think what to say so eventually he just lied and claimed that he hadn't received it. He hadn't received it. But all three of them had received it by recorded delivery. Including the Director of Social Work, Richie Johnson, for Aberdeenshire Council. Okay, so Social Work are not acknowledging the information that shows that this report is in fact false. The report originated um, with Police Scotland Um so I, but we'll, we'll, we'll maybe explore that just in, in a little bit more detail just in a moment. Um, how did things then escalate? If they're not, if not acknowledging um, the evidence that you've got that shows there's no issue of concern, mm. um, did, did they back off? Did they, did they escalate things? Did the social services get more demanding? Yeah, that's exactly what happened. Um, social services against all the evidence and the facts said they wanted to perform quotes and assessment. Now, given that we had sent them information to prove that what the police had said was a lie and given that they had lied that they had not received this, when social services said they wanted to do an assessment logically what they wanted to do was not an independent assessment but it was clearly what they would call in their rhetoric 
outcome based. In other words, my wife and I could see the writing was on the wall here because the frequency of the demands to meet with us, the frequency of the demands to do quotes and assessment, when we knew that already Police Scotland had lied, when we knew there was influential people involved and that social services had lied, we knew there was a gender here, a definite gender. And so my wife and I tried to get legal representation throughout Aberdeenshire because we knew that this was very, very dangerous and that people were t- desperate to attack our family, people in positions of responsibility. So you've now gone from being um, you know, s- school teacher, living a quiet life in the country, <laughs> yeah. um, and within uh, a month or two, you've had this approach, you've gone to the local authorities, the police authorities and other relevant authorities for help, and you're finding that you are, in fact, the target of of an attack. It's quite incredible. Not, not of help. It's quite incredible that you report a man who incredibly tries to buy your son, and not only do the police then re- not investigate this, not only do they then try to persuade you that there's nothing here without investigating, but they then report you to target you to social services and, and they even, hadn't even met the children. It's not as if no one had met the children. No one met the children. So there's no there's no evidence. They've not assessed the they've not assessed the kids. There's no legitimate concern here. And then social work, who who lied, they didn't receive this. Then are clearly determined to quotes assess when actually that means something different. And we we also said well you 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 emailed saying that we wanted time to get a solicitor. We weren't prepared to meet them without a, a solicitor, and they wouldn't give us the time. They kept harassing us and harassing us. So we, we, we tried a number of solicitors as well, which was interesting, and none of them would take the case. But despite me seeing a number of solicitors for a consultation period of an hour or plus, an hour plus, they, we never received a bill for this cons- these consultations. Now, now, this original report came from Police Scotland um, and was under the name of PC Catherine Lamont. Yes. That's right. Um, so you, you got some more information later. Yes, I um, when David O'Neill... When I contacted their manager, the social work people who came out to see us, I asked them who'd sent them and he told me it was this man, David O'Neill, who was based in Fraserburgh, which is the town I worked in. So I phoned him up, but he wouldn't speak to me and I emailed him and I got the gist of the report. I was then told that Catherine Lamont, who I spoke to as an officer on the Friday the 8th of August 2014 to make my statement about this paedophile, I was told that she was the person who had submitted the concern report against our children. So I phoned up Officer Lamont when I received this information and she was off on annual leave. And I, I tried a few times and I spoke to her when she came back. Okay. Um, so right. So you obviously are, are extremely concerned. How, how did this officer turn this report to make it about you? So, so what, was her, what was her reasoning or, ex- or excuse? So I, I asked her, you know, I said, I've just spoke with the manager. Um, I'm trying to get in touch with you. Could you tell me why you've, when we, when my wife and I report a paedophile to you, and I spoke to you now in the station, and then my wife and I together, why you would send a report to? Uh, so PC uh, Catherine Lamont, um, you contacted her regarding the uh, the report of concern that was submitted under her name to social services. Uh, so what what did she say? She um, she was very startled when I phoned her and she didn't appear to, from what I told her, from what the social work manager told me about the contents of the report, she was totally flummoxed, if that's the right word. She had no idea um, about the, the contents of this report and she said to me, look, I'm going to have to go and read the report and if I can call you back in five minutes. So I was asking her, why did you say this? Why would you write these things when we report a paedophile why would you say our family were isolated why would you say we were obsessed with paedophiles or fixated I think the word was and she said look I've got to go and if you don't mind I'll give me five minutes um, she was initially quite hostile but she when she listened to what I had to say she said she would phone back she phoned back something closer to 45 minutes later and in a panic um, and she said to me um, I'd like to come and see you to to talk about this. Um, if it's okay, if I could bring my union representative, uh, Sergeant Claire Smith. And I says, well, why, why, why do you want to bring a union rep? This is not a police union matter. 
and she says, I'd like to come out and try and talk to you and your wife about this. Um, and she was very, very startled or very um, spooked because it seemed at the time there was something not right here, obviously. I knew there was something very not right, but what I later discovered was this was not her report. That she was off an annual leave and then Buckingham went on in that off an annual leave after she was so when she returned, he went off an annual leave. And the report which was submitted by her was not the report which was submitted to social services and the allegations made were fabricated and submitted against our family and um, she clearly had no knowledge of. Okay, and uh, did you then find, you, you, you followed this up with with um, with PERC, the, the, the internal review um, uh, facility within Police Scotland. Uh, what, what happened in, in that? That's right. Um, police... Uh, we declined for her to come out to the, her house because we were advised against any more contact with the police, given how corrupt things had been with them. And so um, after we won our court hearings in February 2015, I complained to Police Scotland and they sent a cover-up report. So I duly um, appealed that and um, Perk uh, made their findings. I appealed to Perk in May of 2015 and Perk then wrote their report and sent me a copy in late September. Um, of 2015 and in that report um, of our um, 12 complaints they upheld 11 of them and one of the key ones was the initial action which referred our family to social services and in that they said that there was no justification for the referral to social services and they went stronger than that and they encouraged in correspondence that I report Sergeant Sam Buckham to the Procurator Fiscal office that deals with police uh, police I can't remember the acronym but it was to do with criminal actions against police officers um, because what they stated was that there was no justification for this um, and they stated that the subject of the report should not have been our family and they and that Sergeant Buchan had obviously altered PC Lament's um, concern report um, where she'd written about Alan Lowe, Buckingham had altered it to make it about our family while well, she was off on annual leave. But she told me on the telephone that she wrote a report and what she told me was that she wrote a report identifying the concerns that we had about the neighbour and identifying the threat against our property and our family based on what we reported about antisocial behaviour, men, three men in the garden late at night, the banging noises, the dead animals, the greenhouse etc etc. She put that in a report, but that was changed into this concern report, which made our family the target of social services as a result of this police fictitious this this report by police Scotland officers. Okay, so that's a fictitious report, um, a doctored report put under the, a name for the person who did not author it, um, which sets social services against your family, and and Perk have essentially endorsed that view formally and officially that that's a, an accurate record of events. That's correct, yeah. So, um, after the social services uh, became more and more interested in your family uh, and you were getting no support from Police Scotland um, and no support from the legal fraternity mm. in, in Aberdeenshire, um, you decided to take a break and, and, and get out of the area was this a safety issue? Is this a child safety concern as much as anything? Yeah, it was, it was primarily a safety issue. We actually, I just recall, we contacted, I contacted a number of firms further, further afield uh, than Aberdeen and Aberdeenshire. I contacted in Glasgow as well. There was a definite degree of fear whenever I mentioned certain individuals um, in a telephone call and there was no, nobody wanted to take the case regardless of big firm or small firm. My wife and I made the decision, or I think it was more driven by yourself, really, yes, actually, based on I, the I, danger. I decided that this was out of hand and it was it was um, getting very quickly out of control and we should take a week's holiday. Um, we'd already started packing up our belongings with the intention of moving because we didn't want to live next door to Alan Lowe. Um, so we'd already started doing that, but I said, we've got to just leave now. No. It's and, not and, safe. And when was this? This, this was, was the just um, the fourth of September. Fourth of September. So, so this is so you, you haven't delayed here. This is only a month after the initial 
report to um, the National Crime Agency. That's so you've had one month of trying to interact with with the police, police Scotland, with the authorities. Things have escalated. Your family's being targeted. Mm -hmm. So you're looking for a little while of safety. Yes, yeah, so what we while whilst things are sorted out, presumably. Our plan was, in, in, in a lucid sense, we thought we need, to, first of all, safety. We wanted to be away because literally there was a new baby and there was men in our garden night after night. We knew that the intention was far from uh, honourable and we knew that they were pursuing this both in the illegal sense and through the legal channels, illegally if you like, through social services and the police. And we already knew that there was nothing here playing by the rules. So the intention was to attack, destroy our family. It was made very clear when they said assessment, they, they, the game was to, to take, our, take our children illegally. So as Jana said, we, um, we were intending to go to Ireland for a week. We booked, I just booked a week's holiday home. In the, anywhere that was available, really. And the plan was to contact our government and alert them, as naive as this seems now in retrospect, two years on, to alert them to the corruption by officers, senior officers, in Police Scotland and in teacher social services. This is a normal response of, of law-abiding people. I've, I've seen this time and time again, that the people will go to the appropriate authorities or go to the police, um, and if the response is the very reverse, it's not just the response is poor or the response isn't helpful or not enough is done, but the response is the very reverse of what it should be, and the people who, are, who have appealed for protection become the target. Uh, what do law-abiding people do under those circumstances? The general response, the typical response, the everyday response, is to appeal to um, the political masters of Police Scotland um, to have that um, that error rectified, to have to have justice. And so we see people doing this a lot. Um, so uh, it's it's it. You may you may with. It, in retrospect, uh, viewed as naive, but it is also the normal, law-abiding, lawful response. Absolutely, yeah. of, of of the reasonable man and the reasonable woman in a, un, in unreasonable and extreme circumstances. They were extremely uh, stressful. Uh, even now, talking about it, I still feel a lot of stress. Strangely, I remember that time very vividly. I remember the stress because. Um, we knew that who do you who do you contact when the police are behaving unlawfully like criminals? Who do you contact when the people who are supposed to protect children, social workers, and the police are targeting your children because you dare to report a paedophile who poses a threat to your children? Who do you contact when people are in your garden at night trying to cause injury and harm to your children, and the police will not fulfil their duty and obligation? And the only people we could think of in the absence of getting legal representation was our government, because they have power. And the only way they have power is by virtue of the fact that we give them our power. And in this case, they abuse that power. Okay, well, in, next, in, the, next, uh, in the next part of this, we'll, we'll, we'll pick up the experience from when you, you, you went to Ireland for uh, a week to uh, contact uh, the, the political masters of, of those involved. Um, and we'll look at how how that process worked out and um, uh, follow the story further. And that ends part two of the Brian and Janice Doherty Dispatches interview. Join us for part three. Thank you.